on this episode of the Oakland Breakdown with Iker and Lehman, presented by Riverwind Casino. We bring you the latest OU football news, including Baker Mayfield possibly going to Seattle and Arch Manning committed to Texas. And football guys talking baseball, we recap OU's loss to Ole Miss in the Men's College World Series. And we finish up giving you our winners and losers of the weekend. Please download and subscribe to the podcast. Rate it five stars and write us a good review. Follow the show on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube. Just search Oklahoma Breakdown on any of those, and you'll find us. All right? Our man Michael Hosty will kick this thing off. It's time for the Oklahoma Breakdown. It's a beautiful Monday, June 27th, and you're listening to the Oklahoma Breakdown with Iker and Layman, presented by Riverwind Casino. Riverwind is Oklahoma City's premier casino experience. There are so many reasons why Riverwind is consistently voted OKC's number one casino, but it all starts with their amazing variety of gaming thrills and excitement. Riverwind's beautiful award-winning environment plays host to more than 2,800 of the latest electronic games with a huge selection of table games, including blackjack, blackjack match, roulette, and Teddy's favorite, craps. No matter what your game, Riverwind has it in spades, and hearts and the beats and bites festival is rolling people randy rogers band on july 9th and there's going to be fireworks after it's a five dollar general admission and kids under 12 get in free there will be a ton of food trucks and there'll be all kinds of things for the kiddos to do including face painting and an inflatable obstacle course to buy tickets visit riverwind.com riverwind casino simply the best now recording this on Sunday night, please leave us a five-star review and a nice comment while you're at it. I let's just, we'll talk about baseball second. How about that? <laughs> let's push it off. Still trying to absorb what happened. Let's give it a little bit more time to simmer. Yeah. Let's uh, we'll, we'll let it breathe. Now it is kind of crazy. It's almost July, man. I mean, it's, I know. Summer, summer. I know it. Whoever says June, what is it? June twenty seconds when summer starts. That's just not true. The no, summer's flying by already. It is. I think I heard someone say ten, ten more Saturdays before college football starts. Oh yeah. So it's going to be here before we know it. Yeah. All right. Let's jump into the OU football stuff. And, and this was interesting. In an interview with Richard Deitch from the Athletic. ESPN chairman Jimmy Pataro confirmed that OU in Texas will not join the SEC until 2025. Remember, Jimmy Pataro, he, he probably has some pretty intimate knowledge of the situation because of the SEC's new deal with ESPN. That new deal, reminder, does not kick in until the 2024 season. Ted, you and I, we've gone kind of back and forth on this. We've talked a lot about the advantages of OU not going until 2025. We've talked about some of the disadvantage, disadvantages of that happening. But does Jimmy Pataro saying this, does it change how you feel about it at all? Change how you're leaning one way or another? Yeah, it's kind of felt this way for a while that like we're going to be here until the 25 season. Now, I don't know if that was always the plan. Um, it sounded like right after this thing got announced, like there was some, there were some moving parts where maybe this thing would happen really fast, but um, I think some, whatever it might be slowed it down. And I, I do believe that it's for the better personally for new games, a new conference, go see some new places, host some, some different fan bases. Personally, I would love it if it started this year, but for our, our athletic programs, I think it's, I think it's best. Like we've had some good, I think the excitement of the move, the, the new head coach in football, softball, winning a national championship, baseball, going to the, the final series, like, there's a lot of good energy with the program right now, and it it puts us in a good position to really get everything exactly where we want it before we make that transition, which, you know, and I think it's Venables that has said it, you know, many times, you only get to do it once. So you better be ready whenever you go and have 
all your programs ready to uh, to be firing on all cylinders. So I, I do think it's best. Right. And the reality of the situation is there's a lot of momentum with all the programs, with or not all, but a ton of the programs within the athletic department. And you have to capitalize on that momentum to get people to donate money. Yep. Because these things, there's, there's an economic reality to all of this. These things that OU wants to do, not just OU football, but e even with Love's Field, with softball, with what they want to do to Eldo Mitchell, it costs a lot of money. And it's starting to cost a lot more money with what's going on in the economy. Mm -hmm. And that's just, that's just the reality of the situation. So you're, you're looking at it going, okay, yeah. Will it be nice once OU gets to the SEC and you start getting that SEC revenue distribution? There's no doubt about it. But with how much money these new projects are costing, and remember, they, are, they were budgeted for X amount. That budget has basically been crumbled up and thrown away with what's going on in the economy. It's crazy. It's, it's crazy. Uh, I mean, Whenever if you, you look at it on a balance sheet, it is, it's wild. The, the increases in costs that, that what compared to what they were projecting and kind of what they were budgeting for, I mean, it's a drastic, drastic increase. But especially for big projects like these are still the cost of still the cost of everything talking about baseball, you know, with a $30 million upgrade. Well, $30 million upgrade gets you about hopefully half of what it did a couple of years ago. It's just, it's crazy what has happened. So, um, I, yeah, that it's a tough time to manage all that for sure. Yeah. But I, I did think that, and we've talked about the possibility of OU going to the sec a year early, right? That 2024 season. And one of the main, main reasons I thought that might happen was, the new TV deal with ESPN. Like it, it felt like a natural transition point for OU where they could work something out with the big 12, uh, similar to what we just saw the teams in the, the American do to get to the big 12 next season. But hearing the guy that runs ESPN say they're not coming in 2024. I was like, well, maybe, maybe I'm wrong. Never mind. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting. It, and I, I think there's some truth to this too. I kind of go back and forth on it because I do believe that OU plays its best football whenever it is like thrown in with the best. But you do have to look at it and say it could be easier. It's an easier path to the semifinal. Now, once you're there, it's it's always going to be tough, but it would probably be easier to win a national championship before you go to the SEC. I don't think there's any doubt. Yeah. Anyone, if anyone would like to argue the other side of that, be my guest. I'm not one of those people. Well, I, I think that once you're there and you reap the benefits of a recruiting cycle, like down the road, but it's like three or four years down the road, once you get into that, where those players are now starters and upperclassmen, but, yeah, for right now, I, I, I do think it's easier. Yeah, I, I don't think there's there's any doubt about that. But that was interesting. It, it was interesting to hear someone in Jimmy Pataro's position say, yeah, even kind of speak on it. So uh, things can change. I mean, nothing's written in stone. I'll tell you this. ESPN wants them in there yeah. in 2024. So uh, th there's a ton of time between now and and then who, who even knows what college football is looking like by then know, man, with how things are changing. It's crazy what we've gone through like two years ago. If we would have some of the things we're talking about now, I would, I would just laugh, but here we are. Uh, and there's no telling what it's going to look like two years from now. So yeah, I would say they probably stick around until 2025, but you're right. You just never know. The landscape can change very quickly. Yeah. Maybe we should just, Stop trying to figure out when this is going to happen and just be patient. But be that would be boring. By it. Yeah. That would be boring. Okay. Exciting news about one of the favorite, you know, one of the, I, I still think the most popular OU player ever, Michael Balco, not him, but Baker Mayfield.
Michael <laughs> Balco. I did not. I did not set that up very well. That's on. That's on me, guys. My bad. Someone heard that and was like, "Who is Michael Balco? What?" <laughs> Michael Balco tweeted that the Seattle Seahawks and the Cleveland Browns are close on an agreement that would send Baker Mayfield to Seattle, and that the and there's other reports that the Seahawks would be open to extending him. Josina Anderson had quite a bit of, on this as well. You look at Seattle's situation with Drew Locke and Geno Smith. I mean, this is something that was rumored a while back, and it had kind of gone quiet, Ted, but we're starting to see some reports out there that the Browns may be willing to pay, you know, nine, maybe $10 million of that 18.8 that Baker is owed for the 2022 season. I just hope he gets out of there, man. It, it's an awful situation he's in right now. Just get him somewhere, please. But Seattle seems like it would be a a really good spot for him to kind of hit the reset button on his career, right? Pete Carroll, uh, everything I've ever heard about Pete Carroll from guys that have played for him in Seattle, love him. Positivity, brings it every day, just a fun guy to be around. Like, I, I think that, I think Baker could use that some in, in his life right now. Ne- needs a little positivity because what he's going through right now, that's got to suck, man. It's just got to be miserable. Yeah. Yeah, there's no doubt about it. And, you know, the timing for Seattle is awesome. Um, especially if, you know, if they can get this done and Cleveland's going to pay 9 or $10 million of that guaranteed 18.8 8 that he's owed, uh, and I'm sure that's why things have gone cold is because, you know, everyone's playing the long game with Cleveland. Like they know that the clock is ticking and they're going to have to pay up. So it pays to be patient. And here they are. And if Cleveland's willing to knock out 10 million of that guaranteed 18.8, uh, that's, that's a nice pickup for them. You're getting a, you're getting a, a, a starter that took the Cleveland Browns to the playoffs and won a playoff game for it, 9 million bucks this first year. And if you can extend him and Baker would agree to being extended, you're going to get him for well below what his market value is just because of how this whole thing is unfolded. Unless you see it differently. I, I feel like he may be in a bit of a, a rush or a scramble and feel like, yeah, I better lock something in long-term. So it feels like Seattle could could have a home run of a deal here. It it would be an interesting. I would love to hear that conversation, right? Because part of me thinks, yeah, if they make a reasonable offer, I mean, you don't want to leave that money on a table, especially you were just injured last year. Yep. But there's also part of me that thinks Baker's the ultimate bet, bet on, on himself. himself. Yeah. I mean, he's just that kind of guy. So. It, it would have to be, it would have to be a good offer. Now, maybe he thinks, "Hey, if you know, if I'm a starter in Seattle, I'm in a good situation with a stable franchise, great fan base. I'm making a ton of in, endorsement money a, as well. And as long as I feel like, as long as he's a starter and he's playing pretty decently, those endorsements are going to continue to happen because he's good in them. I mean, he, yeah. I mean, he he really is, and he is a He's a polarizing figure that causes causes people to react one way or another. And that's what a lot of these brands want. Like pe- when people yeah. are talking about the progressive ads, that's exactly what progressive wants. They don't care if you're annoyed with Baker Mayfield as part of as long as you're talking about progressive, they're all for it. Right. So I I think it would be I think it would be a really interesting conversation between him and his agent in the Seahawks, if they came with some sort of offer where, I don't know what, 30 a year. <sighs> See that, that seems, feels really low, but it's so, it's still so much money. It seems high for me, I guess. I don't know. I, I don't think that they would extend him for that because it's at this 25? point, five. Yeah. I think it's still somewhat of a risk for Seattle too, you know. Yeah. There, there's, there's, there's quite a bit of unknown. I mean, 
I like Baker as much as the next guy, but you do have to admit he had an unbelievable roster the last couple of years. It was, that was a loaded football team. Now they, they had some, some weak points on the roster. There's no doubt about it, but um, you kind of have to look at it and say how much of it was, was Baker because I, and I, I think that they will try and extend him, but at a, it's going to be a discounted rate for sure. And he may say, like, they're going to make him decide between betting on yourself or taking some long-term security. They're not going to put a, a home run deal up, up on the, the platter for him to say, ah, oh, thank you very much, Seattle. Yes, I will. It's uh, going to be a tough decision. Right. I'm just saying, though, isn't Kirk Cousins getting like 35 or 40? Guaranteed. Yeah. I, and – Kirk Cousins has had a more consistent career than Baker Mayfield. Clearly, he's been in the league a lot longer. But Kirk Cousins is making that, man. You know what I mean? Yeah, the, the going rate for a starting quarterback is quickly creeping up to the $40 million range. Just, I, for, just for a starter. Like, it, if, I was, if I was Baker, I wouldn't take anything less than $30 million a year. I'd be, if anything less than that, I'm betting on myself. Yeah. Which may end up being a terrible decision, but I I don't know. Who who knows? Yeah, he's probably he may be a little bit jaded on the betting on yourself deal and like I guess last year wasn't betting on yourself, but it was like maybe putting aside what the smart decision was and pressing on in hopes of a better result whenever, you know, he played through the injury with his shoulder. Uh, he may be to a point now where it's like, you take the money whenever you got the opportunity for it. But I don't know. We'll have to wait and see. I'll tell you this. If my if my top two wide receivers are Tyler Lockett and DK Metcalf, I'm going to go ahead and bet on myself. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, you got some. Well, it's all about the guaranteed money, too. Yeah, like yeah, for sure. 30 or $25 million a year. It's crazy to say because a couple of years ago it would have been the biggest deal in NFL history, but now all of a sudden it's it's changed. But I, if you can if you can get like the majority of that guaranteed, well then that's a home run. You take it. Yeah, we'll see. Hopefully it all comes together, right? We're kind of just speculating, you know, just hoping. We're trying to speak this into existence right. for our guy. I mean, <laughs> oh, okay. It's time to talk about Arch Manning. He commits to Texas, and I, I've got a lot of thoughts on this, but I do want to say this. We can poke fun at Texas, right? They, they went 5-7 and seven last year. They lost to Kansas last year. That's embarrassing. There's no doubt. They should be made fun of for that. They've gone, I think I read, 70 and 55 in the last 10 seasons, which is, I mean, honestly, it's just hard to believe. They haven't won a single Big 12 championship in the last decade. Not one. That all being said, Arch Manning going to Texas is a really big deal. It is, and it, it's, it's okay for us to acknowledge that it's a big deal. It's okay for us to acknowledge that he's a really talented player. I've talked to a lot of guys that work at Rivals 24-7 Sports, and they've said the on three, like all of those places. They said if it, Manning wasn't his last name, he'd still be a top 10 player. Like he's, he's a really talented kid. And we can make jokes about it and say, oh, Texas is back because of ours, but this is significant for Steve Sarkeesian. It's, it's really big for him, and it's okay for us to acknowledge that that's the case doesn't mean that OU's not going to whoop his ass but I saw some people acting like oh this isn't really that big of a deal Texas is going to continue to stink maybe they do but they got the number one player in the country and his last name's Manning it's a big win for Steve Sarkeesian Texas football it's okay to acknowledge that I, I I don't have any problem acknowledging that but the issue for Texas it hasn't been collecting talent it's been developing that talent but you and I have talked a lot about this, Ted. Their big glaring issue, the, probably the biggest difference between OU and Texas over these last 10 years 
has been the level of quarterback play. And the fact that they're getting Arch Manning, that's, that's not insignificant. The kid, the kid could play, and I would anticipate him being a really good college player. He's the number one, he's the number one player in the country for a reason. Yeah, I, I think it is a big, big deal for Texas. Um, here's the first reason. And we've seen this before at OU. When you land a top quarterback, that usually has a massive impact on the rest of that recruiting class. You know, uh, offensive guys particularly, like, but even, even defensive players want to be a part of like a historic signing class, right? And Arch Manning, the, the last name, there's going to be a lot of players that want to sign with Texas because of this. There's going to, it's going to generate a lot of excitement there. Now, football-wise, I think it's interesting. I, number one, I think it's interesting that Arch Manning chose Texas. With the likes of Alabama and Georgia wanting you, and you could easily go there, you go to Texas. I, the only thing I can think of is it's the low, it's the low pressure move. It's a place where you can go. And if it doesn't go well, you can blame it on the school. You can't blame it on Alabama. If it doesn't go well, when you're there, you can't blame it on Saban. kind of the same thing with Georgia right now. So I felt like it was kind of a low pressure because of all, they just went five and seven. Like, it just doesn't really add up. Um, I'm curious to see what it does with their starting quarterback right now. If it's Quinn Ewers, like what, what's the mindset for a guy like that? Um, you know, you're being talked about, you're being uh, pumped up as a guy that's going to go in, take that spot, take this offense to the next level. Now, all of a sudden you're yesterday's news and this kid that's about to be a senior in high school is going to be what everyone's talking about for an entire year. And every time you make a mistake and every time you, you know, and you're just going to be a freshman, you're taking your first snaps. Like everything that you, you do is going to be looked at through the lens of, well, Manning won't do that. Or, you know, he won't be able to beat Manning out if he continues this. So I think it's going to put a ton of pressure on Quinn Ewers. Um, as far as, Arch Manning, I think he's a really good quarterback. But I think most people are assuming he's way better than what he is. No doubt good. Um, Five-star talent, okay, yeah. But some places have him rated as the, like, one of the top recruits of all time? No. Sorry. Not it. He's he is not a once in a generation type of quarterback. He's not. A, a lot of a, a bunch of guys in the recruiting game don't even think he's the best quarterback in his class. Now, I don't know any of that. I've seen just, you know, some of the highlight stuff that's out there and I think he's really good. And I think he has a chance to do some really good things at Texas. But I right, He's not, I don't think he's going to be like a Vince Young type of guy that's going to come in, put the entire world on his back and go win you a championship. Just a little bit different style of a player, but there's no doubt that this is a big move for Texas and for Sarkeesian, it's huge, but guess what? The pressure's on, man. The pressure's on. When you got a Manning sitting in the locker room, it's not going to be his fault. It's going to be yours. Yeah, at, the the pressure is on, but in a weird way, I also think it gives him a lot of job security, right? Yeah. He, he's going to be there for at least three more years, right? I, I mean, because they're not going to want to, they're not going to want to get rid of Sark if that means they could possibly lose Arch Manning, right? And I know A.J. Milwee, the quarterback coach there, has been given a lot of credit. They're like, I don't think Milwee's going anywhere either. So those guys, I really think they may have bought themselves more time, even if they continue to struggle because it's like, no, 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 Arch is coming. We're, once he's here a year or two, we're going to have this thing rolling. 
Wait until but, Saban hires Milwee as the offensive coordinator this this coming off season. Yeah, that would right? be a <laughs> that would be a very Saban like move. But I, I will say, I, I get what you're saying about the like once in a generation type player. I didn't feel that way about Quinn Ewers either. When no, when when I Still think don't. once in a generation type quarterback, like you have to have a certain physical profile. Like basically, you got to look like Cam Newton, Vince Young, a like guy like Trevor Lawrence. Yep. Right. You got to look like one of those guys. But those are the guys he's he's listed with. Right. And he does while he's I'm I'm not he's he's a good athlete. I think he's better an athlete than some people realize. I he think is. some people think he's like Eli or like Peyton, and he got a little more giddy up than than that. But I do think that. The Quinn Ewers and Arch Manning situation is interesting because we just went through it at OU. We just saw this exact same movie. Now, maybe, you know, now Caleb Williams' last name wasn't Manning, but the kid had an incredible amount of hype around him, right? Number one quarterback in the class, the whole thing. And we all thought, hey, this thing's going to go perfectly according to plan. Spencer Rattler, he's going to play great. Then he's going to go to the draft. And then Caleb Williams is going to take over and not going to skip a beat. And this thing's going to be perfect. We're going to keep on rolling. And that's, you're hearing this from Texas fans. Like, hey, Quinn's going to start this year. He's going to get better. Then next year, he'll play one year. Arch can sit and learn and redshirt, get stronger and all that. And then he'll go to the draft and Arch will take over. It'll all be perfect. Very rarely does it work out like that. Ted, if we just we just had a front row seat to where it didn't work out like that at all. I know. I'll tell you exactly what happens. Uh, Quinn Ewers has a solid first year, and Arch Manning's an early arrival. And that UT spring game, buddy, he just lights it up, right? And everyone, there's a buzz out there, man. This Manning kid, and the first sign of mistake from Quinn Ewers in that season. Everyone's going to start the murmurs up in the stands. Yeah, we've seen it before. I, I'll say this. I really wish Arch Manning wasn't going to Texas. I, I know some people are like, oh, he's going to stink once he gets there. I don't think he is. And you mentioned his ability, like the domino effect of this. Mm -hmm. They have a good offense too. Like their system is good. <laughs> Their, their system's good, and they've got the best skill talent going into this season if they can stay healthy. They just do. I've got that. It's just the truth. But I'm a little worried that Texas might be becoming cool, right? We, Texas has been a punchline for a long time now. And this, this kind of makes them look cool. And Arch, Arch Manning could have gone anywhere. I mean, he doesn't need NIO money, like and none of that stuff. Like that clearly was not a big deal. Like they kept this recruitment so quiet, and the fact that he ended up at Texas, like that gives Steve Sarkeesian a a lot of ammo on the recruiting trail. And I don't like it. I don't like it one bit. You know, from an OU perspective, don't like it one bit. Well, I do like it from the perspective of I think it's going to make Texas better. And I think when Texas is better, Oklahoma's better. And that rivalry is everyone's going to watch, want to watch Arch Manning against Oklahoma in the Cotton Bowl. That game oh. is going to be, it's going to be so it's sweet. It's going to be awesome. So I like it from, from that end of the, the spectrum. I, I've never really worried about Texas being good. And maybe it's just the fact that. You know, it's been so long since they have been that I've settled into this this kind of uh, comfort zone. But I honestly believe that the better our surroundings are, the better the teams that we're playing against, the better we become. Yeah, I'm with you. It, listen, it's going to be so fun. I mean, those four or three to four years, whatever ends up, Arch Manning, Starting against OU in the Cotton Bowl. I mean, are you kidding me? Crazy. And we're going to get to cover it and talk about it? Yeah. So, while I'm not thrilled, 
The content, Ted. The content. It's going to be the best. Uh, Eli Manning out there, corn dog mustard all over his shirt. It's going to be great. Cooper. Fantastic. A lot of people forget that Cooper's actually his dad. I feel like I, know. I feel it, bad for him. I feel of. bad for Cooper. Like he had some, I want to say it was like a neck injury or something. I think and he he's like the to... most athletic one of all of them. Right. Right. Yeah. He was a wide receiver, but yeah. all the articles it's like Arch Manning comma nephew of Peyton and Eli, <laughs> like every single one of them. I'm just like, Oh, Brutal. come on, man. Give Cooper Brutal. some love. Yeah. But Hey, Arch Manning is going to Texas. That'll be, that'll be a lot of fun. It should be a lot of fun. All right, let's get to call your shot. And we asked you guys, what was the most important thing that happened for OU football this week? Uh, this first one, Carl M. Belgrave, and he, he's thinking the same way we just were thinking. He says, Arch Manning's commitment to UT, game on. The OU staff operates with a sense of urgency, but more recruiting commitments, big wins in July will build program momentum to keep pace nationally heading into summer ball. I, we have heard Brent Vittables talk a lot about that, right? That they, yeah. they feel like they are going to, they're going to see some of the rewards of the recruiting efforts they've been put in here in the month of July. So hopefully that's coming. Yeah, I think it will. You know, it's interesting. I think I've said this a couple of times, but this recruiting class is going to be the most difficult one for them. Um, you, you know, you're just, you're still trying to convince guys, you're trying to sell them on what you're going to do uh, and how it's going to be different and what results uh, are going to happen. You keep pointing to all these things about, look at this, look at what's coming. And I mean, that plays well, but people like results, right? And you still got to get out there and prove, like show it in black and white that this, this plan is going to get results. Um, but I think everything else is is working perfectly for them. Relationships, uh, direction of the program, all of that. So, yeah, I, I do think it's going to come. But I think this recruiting class, it's going to be later than most, later than typical. Yeah. All right. This other one comes from Spicy Kit 25 on Twitter, who says that sometimes no news is good news. Silence can be golden. It's about that time of year, man. That's a good point. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's true. We, uh, you remember you last year about happen. this time? Yeah. We're talking about armed robbery, right? Uh, yeah. Yeah. So you never know what's going to happen. Yes. No news is good news. That is man. And that that's true on a bunch of different levels. It's true on, uh, guys handling their business off the field and you know, there's, they're putting in some hard work up there. Injuries and stuff do happen. So yes, no news is good news at this moment. Yeah. And this last one comes from Ben Gann who says, Oh, you football watched. Oh, you baseball play for a natty after softball in men's tourney run. These boys are going to be hungry to win. I mean, there's no doubt about it, right? You, you see what the other programs are doing. Uh, within the athletic department, you feel, you feel a certain amount of pressure with that. Now you always feel the pressure. If you're playing football at Oklahoma, don't get it wrong, but certainly with how, how OU athletics seems to be rolling, Ted, and we're about to, about to talk some baseball, but with how things seem to be rolling, there's no doubt the the football guys see that they, they recognize that results, baby. Let's get some results. Um, take advantage of the wave of momentum that everyone's got going on right now in the program and build on it, have fun with it. And yeah, because there's going to be a, there's going to be a, a, the, the level of, of to where our fans take it this season, I think is going to be something we haven't seen in a while. It's going to be awesome. Yeah. All right. Let's get to birthday shout outs. Happy seventh birthday. Tamara and I think the last name is Grep. I don't know. The tweet was a little confusing, but happy seventh birthday, Tamara. Happy twenty fifth birthday to Skylan Akins. Happy fortieth birthday to Angela Nerio. Happy forty third birthday to Travis Hurd. 
Happy 65th birthday to Nancy Cochran. Happy 71st birthday to Lynn Lowry. And happy 30th anniversary to Allison and Josh out in Anchorage. Also, late edition, happy anniversary to neighbors, Laurel and Tyler Bowden. Nice. I love bringing the late edition. I love yeah. it. All right. Let's talk. Let's talk some men's world college. World college, I can't even remember what it's called. <laughs> Men's College World Series. There we go. Figured it out. But first. <laughs> no, I can't. But first. There we go. The only place to stop when you're road tripping is Love's Travel Stops. Love's has over 600 locations in 41 states offering 24-hour access to clean and safe places. Whatever your road trip needs are, Love's has it. Fuel, fresh food, all the snacks and drinks, including, yes, my favorite. Java Amore. That coffee is fantastic. Loves also has you covered if you forget your phone charger or headphones. They've expanded their mobile to go zone so you can grab any of that stuff there. Make sure you download the Loves Connect app for exclusive offers from today's most popular brands. The Loves Connect app also includes a route planner and store locator. When you see that red neon heart on the highway, stop in and say hi at Loves Travel Stops. For a full list of what Loves has to offer, visit loves.com. Anopolis Clothing is the exclusive home for all of our Oklahoma Breakdown merchandise. If you want to live your life in buttery soft comfort, go to opolisclothing.com. That's O-P-O-L-I-S clothing.com and use promo code TED, T-E-D, for 10% off your entire order. You still get a discount on all of the OU and OKC Thunder gear as well. That's opolisclothing.com. Use our promo code TED for 10% off. Buttery soft and 10% off. And a reminder, you can use that promo code in store because they've got ah. some of our merch in the store now, Ted. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. So just you use that when you check out in store as well. And make sure you send your kids to Bishop McGinnis Catholic High School. Bishop McGinnis Catholic High School has a long tradition of educational excellence with a 12 to 1 student to teacher ratio. No student is overlooked. Bishop McGinnis's college prep curriculum offers 22 AP courses. There are numerous clubs and organizations for students to join. And as a proud member of the OSSAA, there are 14 sports offered. If you want to provide the best possible educational and spiritual development for your children, contact Bishop McGinnis Catholic High School or visit bmchs.org. Financial aid is available. All right, a little football guys talking baseball. OU loses game one, OU loses game two, and the Ole Miss Rebels are national champions. I, I will say this. It was a hell of a ride for a team that was picked to finish sixth in the Big 12 in the preseason. That being said, man, I wish they would have played better. I, I, I feel like Ole Miss didn't get their best, Ted, nope. and – they were set up perfectly going into the championship series with the pitching staff. Uh, they, they didn't have the timely hitting that they'd had throughout the NCAA tournament. I mean, uncharacteristic wild pitches, defensive mistakes, uh, mistakes on the base paths. Just, uh, I, I guess let's recap both games, but just not the way you wanted them to play. Like they, they didn't play. I just feel like Ole Miss didn't get their best. Yeah, that's the frustrating part of it. Um, you're okay with losing, but, man, whenever you don't put your best out there and mistake-riddled baseball, it, it, I know those guys are frustrated, but, hey, man, it, you're right. It was, a, it was a hell of a run, hell of a ride. It was fun, and – I think uh, I think it's it's going to be something that this baseball program can capitalize off of. Yep. All right. Game one recap. Lose ten to three in that one. And speaking of uncharacteristic, just Jake Bennett wasn't he wasn't sharp early. Looked a little nervous, right? Yeah. Um, I had more I had the same amount of wild pitches in those first two innings than he had all season long. I think that's what I read. Peyton yeah. Graham. That air was big, and they. They they fell into a four zero hole before Bennett kind of settled in, and they just they they couldn't get to Jack Doherty 
What do you, was, he was perfect through those first five innings in game one. Yeah, it was, uh, it was not good. Now this is, this is really for game one and game two, but just be the way we play defense, how we seem to be rattled at the plate offensively, just some of the mistakes on the base paths and everything. I I feel like, and I wasn't there and it was kind of hard to tell on TV, but I feel like the atmosphere may have got to him a little bit. I mean, cause it, it looked like it was pretty heavy in Ole Miss's favor, at least like the crowd shots were whenever they were going crazy, whenever stuff, happened so maybe that skewed it a bit but it just seemed like a super loud intense environment and it felt like once they made a couple of bad mistakes it it just kind of lingered in their head Uh, and I thought maybe the only thing I could think of obviously it's a huge game there's pressure there but that atmosphere was pretty wild too I was I was told by OU fans that were there and by some Ole Miss guys that and I were there that it was at the very least 85% 85% Ole Miss fans. Yeah. And I was going to save this for the end, but I think it's important to say this. We failed those kids. This fan base failed those kids. Yeah. And I'm including that. Like, and I know, right, it's expensive to travel right now. Like, and I, if, if my son's birthday party hadn't been planned for months on Saturday, I would have been there. But, and the fans that made it to Omaha, you did your part. But the rest of us, we failed those kids. And that's just the truth. And it kind of hurt. It hurts me to say it because I'm part of it. Like I'm, I'm one of the people that has the means to get there and go support those guys. And I didn't do it. Now I can, you know, use the birthday parties as excuses and stuff like that. But the reality is they were playing. They they were playing in the national championship and they were playing on a road game, and you know yeah. what that's like. Brutal. Um, totally agree with everything you're saying. I will say this, however, I'm glad because we were going to go. We were trying to m- move stuff around to where we could go, just couldn't pull it off. I'm glad I didn't go because if I would have had beer poured on me. Whenever someone from Ole Miss hit a home run and we were down, I don't think it would have gone well. <laughs> Especially it would have been like me and you probably sitting together. I know. I It would not have gone well. And I, I don't know how OU fans handle it. Maybe they handled it better because they were outnumbered so much, but that has to be a – that has to be tough to deal with, man. Oh my gosh. That was crazy. I, and just one last thing. It's like, Oh, you fans, we got to step it up moving forward. Yep. Especially when we go to the sec, we just thought that's, that's what the sec is like. Yep. And that that's our soon to be new reality. And we all got to challenge each other because those kids, they they walked into a bad situation there. I mean, it's not easy to be playing for it all and to feel like the entire crowd is against you. Right. That's yeah. not helpful. And some people want to say, oh, well, they they went and won on the road in the regional and won on the road in Blacksburg for the Super. Yes, but this is for the damn national championship, man. Yeah. And we we failed those kids. We did. And I, as I was watching the wheels fall off for Trevin Michael in game two, a big part of me that felt guilty, man. Yeah. yeah. Like that atmosphere, that, that it was all Ole Miss fans. there going nuts. And once again, I'm not, I'm not talking to the OU fans that made the trip. Great job. Way to do your part. I'm, I'm kind of speaking to myself a little bit right now. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, for sure. That's right. It's true. I guess we should recap the games now that now that i've made myself feel bad and a lot of other people (laughs) feel bad but that if you go back and you think about game one right that sixth inning it just 
and it was kind of the sixth inning in, in, in game two as well, but the sixth inning in game one has really felt where it felt like things shifted. And it was a weird momentum shift because it, it felt like, oh, you missed a massive opportunity when they scored two runs. But, I mean, you get the Pettis bunt with the errant throw that made it 4-1. Uh, you get Spikerman walks to load the bases. You got the bases loaded with no one out. And, and Mason Nichols comes in. And strikes Graham and Robertson out. And now he did, yeah, he he walks, what I think, tread away to make it 4-2. But he ends up getting out of that situation, only giving up one run. And it, it felt like in a weird way that shifted a ton of momentum back to Ole Miss. And then, Ted, that eighth inning, I it wasn't quite 55-19 situation but like when i think about the painful stretches as an ou fan yeah watching the watching them hit those three home runs back to back to back it, it hurt my soul man it hurt yeah yeah you know in the sixth inning i didn't get to see that entire uh exchange how all of that played out ever we were all in the backyard around the pool watching the tv and I had uh, I had walked around to the <laughs> to the driveway to I don't know get something from the refrigerator and they scored. I was told by everyone not to come back, so I had to sit in the driveway in a lawn chair <laughs> and wait for that whole thing to uh, to happen before I was allowed back in into my own backyard. But um, yeah, it was brutal watching those just hit monster bombs off of us in the eighth inning and seal the whole deal. That was brutal. Yeah. Uh, so many runs with two outs for Ole Miss in game one. Oh, you struck out 15 times. Just, just hard to win games when that happened. Then game yeah. two, really the first five innings, just kind of boring, right? Hunter Elliott for Ole Miss and Kate Horton were just dealing. And then the sixth inning, I am, I'm going to try my best not to cuss a lot right here. But the interference rule in baseball, don't cuss, is stupid. <laughs> that, that play, that was bullshit. It was. And it takes a run off the board that would have scored anyways, no matter yeah, what was. happened at first. Well, he was already there before any of the stuff at first happened. He's already across the plate. I mean, Nicholas scores no matter what. What? In the bags inside the line, I have questions. I don't watch a ton of college baseball, but even the announcers are like, yeah, well, that's the rule. The rule's stupid, but yeah, that's the rule. And they're like, it needs to be changed. Oh, thanks. That makes us feel better. Who knows what happens in the sixth inning if that, if that call doesn't happen? There's no doubt about it. And I think there's a time to call that play. You have to account for the horrible throw, right? They're not accounting for the horrible throw. If, if he's running right down the line, it still hits him in the back. Right. Yes. They, I, I, I thought it was so horrible. So, so horrible. I thought, I thought Skip Johnson was going to get tossed. Maybe he should have. I don't know. But that, in my opinion, that call is egregious. And I know what the rule is. And I know, I, I know that you have to run in between the two chalk lines. I know that call is egregious. That moment in that game, that call is awful and there's no way around it and i will never be convinced otherwise that call is horseshit i thought we said we weren't gonna cuss <laughs> sorry try. kids try. we try we try our best but yeah that happens and then of course gonzalez you know kate kate horton makes one mistake all day and gonzalez makes him pay for it and sends a bomb over the right field fence one nothing, and then you, then the seventh play, but it it felt, 
you know, Crooks gets the rally going a little bit. The uh, blooper RBI from, from Nicholas and what was it? A four pitch walk yeah. for Pettis, right? When he was just yep. doing the fake button thing, yep. which turns out could have just done that all day, I guess. But. Yeah, it's tough. Puts the pressure on the pitcher, makes that strike zone look tiny. It, that was, that was good. I, the way that they bounce back from the interference thing, it, it says a lot about that team. Cause that felt like sitting on the couch, watching it. Like I felt deflated. And the fact that they were able to bounce back, go up to one, then what Horton strikes out the side in the seventh and is just mowing guys down. Like it, I, I was really impressed, but the bottom line with game two is OU's up two to one. And, you know, Horton had struck out 13 at that point before Skip Johnson goes and gets him. You got five outs to get, and you're handing the ball to Trevin Michael with a one-run lead. If you asked any guy on that team, if you asked Skip Johnson, if you would ask any fit, like, you're taking that situation 100 times out of 100. Yep. And unfortunately, it looked like the pressure got to Trevin Michael a little bit. And now the, the hit and run was perfect. I mean, the way, the way that they executed that, uh, then the single to tie to two, but the wild pitches, that was just, that was where, that was where I felt guiltiest as an OU fan, not being there because I felt like that whole stadium was kind of collapsing in on him yeah. with how crazy the old Miss fans were going and it affected his performance and another wild pitch you lose. It was, uh, it was tough to watch. Yeah. Yeah. It was, uh, it was disappointing and, you know, and it just kind of goes back to, they left, they left so much out there, um, building mistakes outs in foul territory that they could have had easy outs. I say easy plays that you'd expect them to make and that they've made all year. Um, you know, mistakes out on the base paths just couldn't couldn't figure it out at the plate. It looked like, and, and credit Ole Miss for this, but it looked like our guys were just they were lost up there. You know, they were sitting off speed, and and the fastball would blow by them on on certain situations, just one guy after another, and. I don't know. Uh, they never got into a into a really good a good groove, a good rhythm, and you know that's one of the things that Ole Miss did throughout the two games is keep sending new guys in, and you know end up facing a bunch of different pitchers. So it was tough. Yeah, just I mean they just struck out a ton. Yeah, I mean just uh, when you look at the two games, um... and and the weird thing about it, a lot of strikeouts looking and a lot of strikeouts on swings that were not rhythm swings. Like I'm lost guessing swings, you know? So I, I will say this, the catcher for Ole Miss was one of the most egregious framers I've ever seen in my entire life. <laughs> oh my gosh, dude, just ridiculous. Like, I mean, it was credit to him. He was, I, he was very good at it, but I, uh, he fooled, he fooled the umpire a couple of times. And I was like, I hate that guy. Yeah. I, whenever, who was it? Was it Kirk's that got hit by pitch? Who was that? Uh, it? Anundo, I think, right. He was the, was that who was okay. Yeah. I thought they were going to reverse that. I did too. And I'm telling you what I was, I was not in a good place. If that would have happened, I would not have been in a good place. Some something would have been broken. Oh, it was so frustrating because that first call is just the most god awful thing I've ever seen in my life. I don't care what the rule is. I don't care what the baseball guys say. Horrible. Yeah, I, I will say this. Um, seemed like there were a lot of people that were poking fun at OU uh, for losing in the national championship in baseball. And I, I've never understood this. 
and I don't care what fan or what team you cheer for. And, and maybe it's just the way I'm wired. I do not understand people that make fun of teams for losing in the national championship when their team had their ass at home. <laughs> right. It does not make sense to me. And this is kind of the example I put out there on Twitter. It's like, I will make fun of Texas for losing to Kansas in football. That is fair. They deserve to be made fun of for that. But if Texas is playing for a national title and something and they lose, you're not going to hear a damn word for me. If, if they didn't lose <laughs> right. to OU. Right. Now, yeah, if they lost the... to OU. Oh yeah. It's on like softball. I mean, that's exactly what happened. Yeah. I'm going to go after Texas a little bit. Oh, you beat him. But you haven't had success in a while. If that's something that you're doing, I just don't get it. It's like, Oh, you losers. Like what? I, I am one of those people. If OU is not in the title, or if they're not in the championship, I'll comment maybe on what's happening in the game. I'm not making fun of anyone because OU wasn't there. That's right. I don't know. Yeah. Maybe I'm just different. And maybe I'm just, uh, maybe I'm getting old, man. But that's no, just no, how no, I've no. always been. I think I, I, that is just a very, the social media does, it, it magnifies the margins quite a bit at times. And I think this is, uh, this is one of those instances. I think most people kind of, kind of get it. I, you really, it, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense whenever your team's at home watching to try and clown someone for losing a national championship game. It doesn't yeah. work very well. You it's like, it's the easiest cell phone of all time. You know? There's some Oklahoma State fans that hate listening to this podcast that are like, oh, that was me. Dang it. <laughs> Don't do it. It makes uh, – and listen, I, I'm not trying to be a buzzkill. I'm not trying to tell people not to have fun. I, it's just not something I do. Right? It's never made sense to me. But right. I, I don't know. Maybe I'm just one, – one last thing about OU baseball. You're going to love this. You and I – you and I both love Jamar Cain, right? Great guy. He's now at LSU. And he, he has a tradition, right? When he gets a commitment from a recruit, like when a recruit calls him and says, hey, coach, I'm coming, he puts out this, this gif of a cartoon dog, like snickering is the best way. It's like, he, 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 like that's, I don't know, that's his thing. He did it when right. he was at OU, when he was, he's a defensive ends coach. And he sent that tweet out right when the wheels were followed off for Trevin Michael <laughs> and OU fans were going after him. And I basically texted him. I was like, bro, what are you doing? He's like, what is going on? He was not watching the game. He actually FaceTimed me. He was watching naked and afraid. And he was like, what? <laughs> He was like, what wired OU fans losing? I, I was like, dude, they literally just blew the lead and, and lost the national championship in baseball right when you tweeted that. He was like, oh, my God. It was it was incredibly bad timing, but I'm here to defend Jabbar Kane because he FaceTimed me right after it because I tweeted him. I was like, bro, he got some bad timing. And he FaceTimed me right after that. And he was like, "I what, what did I do? <laughs> <laughs> the best part of that is that he was watching naked and afraid. That is hilarious. <laughs> oh, it was. Yeah. So if you're one of those people that fired off a tweet at Jamar Cain, maybe, maybe apologize. He, he didn't, he didn't mean any, uh, anything of it. Got a big recruit though. He's pretty fired up. Oh, good for him. Dude, I had hilarious. a long, I had a long conversation with him because he's at LSU now, right? That's you're, yeah. you're going after a lot of big time recruits. He was telling me about some of the, like like the demands some of these kids have now crazy huh and he he's like hey i can't do anything like that's that's illegal and all that stuff like he 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 walks the walks the straight arrow but he's like these kids come to me with the straight up demands now so there's inflation in the recruiting game too huh is that what's going on <laughs> sounds like it man <laughs> all right uh, that's such a good story. That, I mean, the, that was so, it, the timing of it was so funny. That's Let's great. finish up. 
with our winners and losers of the weekend. But first, it's time to get back out on the golf course, people. And there's nothing better to drink on the course than the number one seltzer in golf, Clubby Seltzers. Clubby Seltzers is an Oklahoma company that is already winning national awards because their product is delicious. It tastes exactly like a club special, but it's a seltzer. They're not just for the golf course either. They're perfect to drink by the pool after mowing the lawn, whatever. If you haven't tried Clubby Seltzers, go grab some. You won't regret it. The first variety pack is out. To find a place near you that has Clubbies, visit ClubbySeltzers.com. The variety pack's delicious. Hammered a couple of them at my Great. son's What's your favorite? Party. I like that. What is it? Strawberry lemon? Is that the right one? The red one. What's the red one? Uh, that may be right. I like grape. Grape's my go-to. Really? Mm-hmm. The original, maybe the maybe we're just overthinking it. The original one, so good. Hard to beat. And attention, business owners. You need Insurica in your life. Insurica is one of the country's largest insurance brokers with 30 offices throughout Oklahoma, Texas, and the Southwest. Insurica is able to customize programs by accessing the latest information from many insurance carriers. They compare and contrast coverage offerings and pricing in order to design a cost-effective, comprehensive program to meet your business's specific needs. Insurica's clients become best-in-class businesses by working with Insurica's team of advisors to manage risk. Purchasing insurance is only one way to protect your business. Best-in-class businesses win by avoiding loss in the first place. If your business partners with Insurica, you'll save huge amounts of money and take back control of your total cost of risk. I'm an Insurica client, and you should be too. If your business wants to be best-in-class, connect with Insurica at Insurica.com. That's I-N-S-U-R-I-C-A. Dot com. As always, Ted, kick us off. Who do you have as your winner of the weekend? Well, uh, this is a, a bit of a continuation of the baseball talk, but I had to had to single him out and give him his credit. Winner of the week's Kate Horton. After his last two starts, with all the eyeballs that he's had on him in the in uh, in baseball, Major League Baseball draft coming up. Uh, unfortunately he is draft eligible and Mm. that kid made him some money. His last two outings have been incredible after having the surgery, working into it, uh, getting that, that slider down that fastball, 96, 97 slider and curveball combo is just unreal. He was placing it. He was comfortable throwing 96, 97 uh, through 100 pitches, was just locked in, had great command. That kid made some money out there his last two starts. What? Uh, 25 strikeouts in his last two starts, something like that. It's crazy. For those of you that don't know, at one point he was an old Miss commit. And to go out there, Right with hey, it's it's winter go home for Oklahoma after they just put up a 10 spot the night before. And you set the men's college world series final record for strikeouts with 13. That well, is yeah. that's big time. And I I think if you ask Skip Johnson, he he'd do what he did again and he'd do it every time, but There's got to be a lot of OU fans. I think it's only natural to wonder why I'm if you just keep, keep rolling with them. And I know the pinch cow and the Tommy John surgery in his past, right. That skip skip would do it a hundred times out of a hundred, but there is, there's a lot of us wondering why I'm if you just keep nine on the mound right there. Well, here's the thing. He went seven and a third, I think 13 K's three hits one run no walks isn't that right it's ridiculous man yeah that's incredible and didn't get the win so that tells you kind of everything you need to know right there about oh you're not playing a a complete game um just couldn't couldn't get enough runs in there to to matter couldn't generate enough offense but he's the winner because that man made some money over his last two starts without a doubt yeah Peyton Graham may have lost some. Kate Horton made it all. Yeah. Well, he, it was weird. Do you think the spotlight got I don't to know, man. a little bit? 
I, it was that or people figured out he can't hit a curveball. <laughs> yeah. Well, that. I mean, do that it, was I the guess. rumor coming out of that. What was it? That Gainesville regional. But that was kind of, you know, people are saying, "Hey, you just throw him a bunch of off-speed stuff," and I, I don't Trouble know. But with the curve. Good movie. <laughs> I enjoyed that. Did you like that movie? I liked that movie. Uh, it's been a long time. I'm it's trying the to sound, remember. Ted. He can hear it. Is it the... Um, was Clint Eastwood in that one? Oh, yeah. Okay, yeah, I'm thinking of the same movie. Okay, yeah, it was good. It's fine. Not bad. <laughs> it was fine. <laughs> Who do you have? Yeah, Kate Horton's going to be rich, and I hope all you fans enjoyed him because I, there's, no, there's no way he comes back, right? I mean, that would just be... I feel like it'd be irresponsible. Uh, well, if he comes back, he's not eligible again for the draft until when? I, I'm not even going to pretend I know all the baseball rules, man. It's it's hard. It's, Especially it's something like three years. Really hard. Yeah. I Because he's a draft eligible freshman or something that I guess it's not, not typical. But if he didn't go, I think he's not eligible for – like a couple more years after yeah, that. Yeah, isn't that how it works? I, I don't think know. so. But, but clearly big baseball guys right here. <laughs> We've talked to hey in in our defense, I don't think anyone knows how the baseball draft works. Yeah, it the interference rules stupid, the way the draft I actually kind of like the baseball system with how it how it works for the high school kids and stuff, but I there's just too many rules. Or I was trying to read about Aaron Judge's arbitration earlier this week i was like this this system arbitration is, is crazy it's insane now i don't know who even the came yankees up worked with that it system. out yeah that system is wild all right sir tell me what i'm worth like what <laughs> it's just weird well, that's all right, why they all that's why it's a home runner strikeout league is because everyone goes to arbitration it's like yeah you don't hit enough home runs sorry you don't you make you're making the what you should make sorry uh, that's a bummer, but I'm sure Aaron judge is about to be very, 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 very yeah. richer. All right. Who do you have as your loser of the weekend? Well, I had to skip away from sports a little bit. Um, I saw this and I just, I was fascinated by it. Ben Affleck let his 10 year old drive his Lamborghini SUV. I guess he let him sit in the driver's seat. I don't know, but they were like out. They weren't like in his driveway. They were out somewhere and he backed into another car, like a BMW. <laughs> How does that happen? How can you let your 10 year old drive your Lamborghini and back into another car? I, I don't know. But first of all, the, uh, I'm looking at a picture of it. The the Lamborghini, it's the yellow is, one, right? It's bright yellow. Yeah. There's which <laughs> you you rent a bright yellow Lamborghini to drive around in. That's just that's an interesting do? choice. What I'm over do? here written minivans, Ted, and we've got Affleck oh. who's written Lamborghini SUVs and letting his ten year old drive it. You talk I about differences the, in the world. The ten year old's going around to check out the damage. Uh, <laughs> Just incredible, <laughs> incredible picture. Oh, well, yeah. Bright yellow Lamborghini SUV, which, you know, we could get into that if we want. Like, what's the point in buying a Lamborghini SUV? That's, uh, I don't know. I'm sure it's great. I'm sure it's amazing. But if you're going to spend that kind of money, you're getting a race car. Get the supercar. But I don't know, man. I had to question Ben Affleck a little bit. A, a lot of bit letting the 10 year old into the driver's seat of the, I don't know, at least I'm guessing $500,000 Lamborghini SUV. That that's a, I, I try to gather parenting things. I try to absorb as much as I can from other parents. Like I, I want to learn and, and gain knowledge from their parenting wisdom. I now know not to let my son drive a car when he's 10 because that seems stupid. And now I know, <laughs> and I don't think it would have crossed my mind uh, to ever let a 10 year old drive a car, 
but now I know for sure. Don't let him do that. Nope. That's a no. I mean, it's questionable to let a 10 year old drive a golf cart, much less a, uh, a Lamborghini. Yeah. I I'm really just worried about this, uh, new development with my son that started about a week ago. He will, he will now only eat pretty much with a fork. Hmm. And I'm not talking a kid's fork, Ted. He wants a big guy fork. I'm talking, he wants a grown adult fork with some weight to it. If you hand him one of the like plastic kids forks, he gives me the side eye and he just kind of tosses it. Discard. And he looks at me and he's like, we did, you know, the smash cake, right? Yeah. We had his first birthday party on Saturday. We did the smash cake. He just looked at me. Just looked give me, at me. Give me a fork, bro. It's like, where's my fork? As soon as I hand him a fork, he starts digging into the cake, eating it like a sophisticated guy. That's I was like, what amazing. Are we? It was people were like, oh, did he get it all over him? I was like, no, it, <laughs> it all went in his mouth because he was eating it with the damn fork. Next thing he's going to be looking for you for a razor and shaving cream. Just, you know, like, come on, where's, next, where's the next, utensils? Next thing he's going to be like, dad, where's the Lamborghini for me to drive? <laughs> He's on a, he's on the right path. I mean, he's he's got the dexterity down at one, and that's a that's not a small kid. Yeah, that's a large kid. Ninety eighth percentile in weight, Ooh. like ninety third percentile in height. He's I know I shockingly tell. he's. I saw the picture of you and your wife with him on the uh, the court down there in Dallas, and both of you are very tall, and she was like holding him like kind of like this. <laughs> it's like. I mean, <laughs> did not look like a one-year-old. It was yeah. pretty cool. Uh, now that we've given you all the latest updates on my one-year-old <laughs> son, uh, let's get to my winner and loser. But first. First Fidelity Bank is a full-service financial institution based in Oklahoma, tailored solution for all your personal and business needs, checking accounts, saving accounts, home loans, and much more. They do it all, whether it's online banking from your computer or mobile banking from your phone. Everything is stress-free with FFB. Making mobile deposits, paying bills online, and moving money to different accounts could not be easier. First Fidelity Bank provides free ATMs worldwide, making banking convenient wherever you are. They also give back to the community. FFB donates a total of more than $500,000 to local charities and educational foundations. Make your life easier and go bank with First Fidelity Bank. Visit FFB.com for more information. And if you're a whiskey or bourbon drinker, stop what you're doing, head to your favorite liquor store, and buy some Balcones products. you got to grab some of Balcones Lineage Single Malt Whiskey. It was just voted one of the top 20 whiskeys in the world by Whiskey Advocate, and you'll be shocked by how affordable it is. Also, you got to snag some of Balcones Baby Blue Corn Whiskey. It's made from blue corn. That's the fancy corn. And that is why it has won more than 25 awards. Last but certainly not least, you got to buy some of Balcones Pot Still Bourbon. It's big flavors make it the perfect bourbon to drink year round. Remember in 2012, Balcones Single Malt won the best in glass competition, beating brands like Johnny Walker and McAllen. It became the first American distillery to win that competition. This stuff is the real deal, people. If you love great whiskey and bourbon at a great price, then Balcones products are the only way to go. The whiskey may be made in Texas, but the owners, yes, they are from Oklahoma. To find a liquor store that has it, visit balconiesdistilling.com. All right, for my winner of the weekend, thought about going with the Detroit Pistons. Thought they had a really good draft. I mean, the fact that the Kings, they, they're still the Kings. They didn't take <laughs> Jay Nivey with the, with the fourth pick. They let him go. Let him go to five to, to Detroit, and Detroit gladly took him. At five, I also like the trade up to get Jalen Duran. At thirteen, you start thinking about the rebuilding process under Troy Weaver, who used to be in the Thunder organization. There, Detroit, with I mean, you think about Jaden Ivey and Cade Cunningham and Sadiq Bay there in that backcourt. It's gonna be a lot of fun to watch. Man, I love Ivy. I love the energy he breaks. So I'm I'm excited for the good people of Detroit. Yeah, uh, it's been a while since they've been competitive, man. It's been a long while since Detroit's been competitive. They had a nice little run there, early 2000s. But, man, uh, and that place was crazy for Pistons basketball whenever they were as good as they were. 
And uh, I know it's been a long drought. Be nice to see them uh, get back and in, in being competitive there in the East. Yeah, but my winner of the weekend, the Oklahoma City Thunder, baby. We we haven't we haven't been able to recap the Thunder's draft. Big moves, big moves made by Sam Presti. They end up with four picks in the top thirty-four. They ended up with three picks in the top twelve, and I let they give up three first rounders. Right to get to get Usman Dang from the New York Knicks. I love how Presty kind of framed it. He was like, "Actually, we wanted eleven and twelve. We wanted we knew the two players we want, so we kind of viewed it as those three picks to ensure that we got the two guys that we want." And they did. I mean, you you look at them getting Usman. I think that's how it's. Is it? Am I saying that right? Usman. It works for me. Yes, yes, you're saying it right. Okay. There we go. <laughs> OD. Ooh, that's a good nickname. I like that. OD. But so you get you get OD at 11 and then you get Jalen Williams at 12 and it, it seems like there's a lot of excitement within the organization. Of course there is because you know you you got the guys that you wanted, but Chet Holmgren at 2 is is the big one. And, and I know surprisingly Jabari Smith was there. But for me, I was actually happy that Paulo Bancaro went first because he was my favorite player in the draft, and it was going to hurt my soul <laughs> for the Thunder to pass on him and take Chet. So I didn't have to go through that experience, which was nice. But as far as the Thunder taking Chet instead of Jabari Smith, listen, man, I'm I'm going to trust Sam Presti. You know, when he's when he's been drafted in the top five, been pretty damn good. So. If he thinks Chet's going to be, you know, an all-star caliber player, you know, possibly all NBA type player seems to fit real fit really nicely with Shea and Giddy. Um, we'll let those guys create space, the floor for him, you know, adds the rim protection defensively, but most importantly for me, Ted, Chet Holmgren wanted to be here. Yeah. That's always critical. I mean, you, you heard him say it in his presser when he got to Oklahoma city, right? He said, now that I'm, here, I can officially say this is where I want to be. And I I know when I heard that, I was fired up. And I can't imagine other Thunder fans weren't fired up when they heard that because we, we want the guys that want to be here. Like Oklahoma City is a special place. We understand it's not for everybody, but it's for Chet Holmgren. And the second he said that, he's one of our guys. He yeah. is. I, there are going to be a lot of seven jerseys sold because of that statement alone. Yeah. Um, I like it. I like the pick. I, I've got some questions about him, but I, I see the skill. I see the talent. Uh, I'm, I'm not too worried about like, how lean he is and putting on weight. I think that stuff's going to come uh, as he matures and gets older. Still a young kid, but he's got a ton of skill, ton of skill. And you know, they're starting to quietly put together a really talented lineup. It's it's a different lineup, but it's super talented. And it just kind of plays to that uh, positionless type of basketball that, you know, that you started to see in the NBA where you're getting a, a, a pretty decent group of guys that can do a little bit of everything uh, and play in some different roles and handle the ball and shoot the three. And, so I like that pick. I'm uh, I'm excited about it. That's the one I wanted him to make. And uh, I just, cause I think it's the most interesting and I think he probably has the highest ceiling. I think some of those other guys that are maybe better ahead of the game athletically right now may have an easier transition, but I think he's got a higher ceiling. Yeah, uh, I'm with you. And I just, I kind of like the way he carries himself. I like man that carries himself with confidence yeah. and you got, you got to be confident to wear that suit to the draft and to wear the dice iced out <laughs> necklace. I mean, you gotta, you gotta be confident to rock that. Yeah. I mean, you absolutely have to. So between him and OD, I'm definitely going to keep calling him that. That's an awesome nickname, but a, you know, a six ten Frenchman that played in Australia that, uh, I mean, I think he's got a long way to go shooting the basketball, but when it comes to his ability to handle the ball, everything I read and watched looks like he's, 
he's got the athletic profile you want a guy to have. And then they drafted two guys named Jalen Williams. Uh, <laughs> I mean, what are the odds, right? You draft two guys named Jalen Williams, and I know one's going to go by J Dub and one's going to go by J Will, but I just want to call the guys by their names. That's but I guess funny. they said no one really calls him Jalen. So J Dub went to Santa Clara, 6'6, versatile guard, shot 40% from three. How about that? Nice. We actually got a guy that could shoot. And then the other guy is from Arkansas, J Will, who I think, I think you and I are both going to really like this guy. I talked to a couple people about him. He's like 6'9 ish. 240, super physical. Sam Presti described him as a blocker slash tackler in the presser. And I was like, this sounds like our guy. And I like that. I read something. The best charge taker in the draft, according to Kevin O'Connell from the huh. ringer. Okay. So seems like an effort guy. You we love effort guys. We're football guys. We love effort guys. Love effort guys. Love high energy guys. Love black uh, blocker tacklers in basketball. You always need some of those guys on your on your bench. Uh, no doubt about that. I like it. It's a pretty uh, <laughs> it's a it's a pretty sweeping draft, except for name wise. Uh, you know that wasn't very sweeping. There, kind of isolated that, but everything else, I like it. Exciting. Yeah. It is exciting. It. I'm excited for the future of Thunder basketball, and. Maybe, maybe this year they only win, you know, 30 something games, but it feels like they're going to be really good in the not too distant future. And that's fun. I agree. They, I agree. They've got one of the, the best young cores in all of basketball and, and we'll see if it, it all comes together, but I'm excited. I'm really excited. It's going to make next year weird. You know, it's, because I, they're probably going to be good enough to win some games next year, right? And you're going to be like... But the, the thing for me is, remember, the way the lottery is, like the 14 worst records are in the lottery, right? With how many first-round picks they have, I'm okay with them winning some more games if, you know, because maybe they have the 10th pick, their 11th pick. Presti's got still, he's got so many picks no stuff to, to throw pass. in, to yeah. move up. You know what I mean? Yeah. And at no. some point you can only have a, a certain number of guys on your roster. You can only pay so many guys. Yeah. And I don't, I, you just building through the draft is such a long process and you can't, you can't miss, you know, you just can't miss. And I just hate the, uh, I hate the purgatory of you know not playing good enough to make the playoffs, but not being bad enough to get into. Because a lot of these drafts in the in the NBA are like a a five or six player draft, you know. And then after that, it's just you're kind of you know you're throwing at a dartboard, guessing on some guys. And I know there's going to be value picks in there in every draft outside of those top five or six, but. I'm just saying like it gets way more difficult. So I I'm 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 for them to start winning some basketball games and we'll see what happens. I think we all are. I think two seasons of watching what we've watched, we've we've been through enough. We deserve to watch this franchise win some games. And I will say this. I I've been going back and forth. I I think I think it's spelled D I E N G. Usman, I've heard a lot of Jang, like it somehow is a J. Is that what we're going with? Because Dang, or is it? Are we going with the Jang? I think it's Jang, and the I, only I agree. Reason is whenever we did the draft special the other day, that's how he said it, and because I'm used to because it's spelled the same as like Luau Dang's name, right? So whenever he said that, it kind of hit me and i was like huh but he seems to know what he's talking about with the kids so so I'll give it to him luau dang is d-e-n-g oh it's d-e i believe so if my memory serves me correctly and then yeah, right. this is usman jang d-i-e-n-g we got to get okay. the names right 
Yeah. Now there's J Dub and J Will, but I got to We got to get the 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 French guy's name right. I think you've got it though. I think. Okay. Dang. I think it's been established. Right. I think I might have said dang earlier, but yeah. I was I was indecisive. I was going yeah. back and forth. I'm sticking Jang. Final answer. Let's go. Boom. Nice. A lot of people. That is an upside, upside, upside selection. And the fact that Presty gave up what he gave up to go get that kid makes me real excited. It's not a Presty draft until he takes uh, a foreigner no one's heard of. I, I'll say this. Pronounce their name. I'll say this. At the very least, he turns into like an Andre Robertson type guy. Be good. Which you would hope he can shoot a little better than that, but he's got you right. The length, the athleticism, the defensive mentality. Now he's got a long way to go. What is he like 19 years old? So we'll see. But like you said, exciting times and ready to watch him win some games. All right. For my loser of the weekend, thought about going with Bryce Harper. Ouch. Hit by pitch and it breaks his thumb and that sucks. But the reason I brought this up, he had an all time quote after this all went down because last year, remember he got hit in the face. Yeah. With the ball. And he only missed a couple of games from that. And this was this was the quote from Bryce Harper post thumb break. I kind of wish it would have hit me in the face. I don't break bones in my face. I can take ninety eight to the face, but I can't take ninety seven to the thumb. Mm. <laughs> it's a fantastic post game quote. God, just brutal. I can only imagine how bad that thumb had to have hurt getting hit with that like there's some things that you can just picture like there's worse injuries there's no doubt but just getting your thumb crushed by a 97 mile an hour fastball and breaking it it just has to hurt so bad and i'm it's gonna have a heartbeat for a week and it's not gonna feel good yeah no thanks i'm good don't need that in my brutal. life. I'm good. Brutal. Uh, also thought about going with Skip Ga- Skip Bayless. Did you did you see the Russell Westbrook tweet? He, he's had enough. He's had enough. He's, he's fed up. Don't call the man Westbrook anymore, Skip Bayless. You didn't see it. Russell Westbrook is uh, told Skip Bayless to watch his mouth and said to not say anything on Twitter that he wouldn't say to his face, which was absolutely hilarious but also skip bayless had to see that and be like i've won i've broken him finally (laughs) finally yeah that's what he's trying to do um and and we'll see what he does Uh, that's uh, it could be interesting to see if he uh if he backs off a little bit it that will be interesting i've got a i've got a feeling he won't (laughs) yeah probably won't but my loser of the weekend the brooklyn nets It seems like that whole thing's falling apart, man. So this is this is the most Kyrie Irving thing ever. He gives them a list of teams he's okay going to if they were to like do a sign and trade, right? And on the list, it was the Lakers, the Clippers, the Knicks, the Heat, the Mavs, and the 76ers. And the list is a little odd because like none of these teams have any cap space. And there are several reports out there that some of the teams on the list want nothing to do with Kyrie Irving, which makes it even better. But he's like, yeah, here's my list just in case. And all these teams are like, whoa, 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 man, we, you don't, don't bring us into this, which is, which is fantastic. And I guess Kyrie, he's got to decide this week if he'll opt in to that final year of his contract or if he will opt out and become an unrestricted. Is he super max? Is he like 45? Oh yeah. Oh yeah big money guy but there's that there's the Kyrie situation for the Nets and now there's the Kevin Durant situation I mean that is a that is a new component of things for the Brooklyn franchise reports that he's lost confidence in the Nets management and now I guess he's monitoring the whole situation with Kyrie maybe he thinks they mishandled the whole Kyrie thing uh, reports that he's not recruiting anyone in free agency to Brooklyn. Uh, does not sound like things are going terribly well for the Brooklyn Nets right now. And I saw there's a lot of people firing up the old trade generator, 
right, for Kevin Durant to get him out of there. So does what's his, his – What's his uh, contract status? He just uh, signed an extension with them last year, so he's got like three more yeah. years. Pretty sure. That. They're not going to trade. There's no way they'll trade him, right? I don't even I, – I don't even know what you could trade him for. I've heard some people think that maybe you go to to Toronto and you ask for Scotty Barnes and some picks, and maybe another player or something, which, okay. I don't know if Durant wants to play in Toronto, but, hmm. or go to maybe ask New Orleans. If you think you can fix Zion's health issues, maybe you ask for him and some picks and a couple other players or something, but it's Kevin Durant, man. Any, anything you trade him for, you're going to have to get an absolute haul back. It's Kevin Durant. I know. That's what I'm saying. I, 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 I can't believe they would. I mean, he may be pissed, but I, if you're the owner, you go and fire the whole management before you trade Kevin Durant away. It, if you're the owner, you go, hey, Kevin, we, we brought Kyrie here for you, man. <laughs> the guy's insane. It, we we did it for you, and it just hasn't gone well. He doesn't want to play, and and Ben Simmons. Now, what do you mean is, we mismanaged the Kyrie thing? Yeah. Maybe you mismanaged the. You Kyrie told thing. us to get him. <laughs> it's kind of nice to be able to do that and not have any consequences with it. Yeah, it's also hilarious. Ben Simmons is on that team, and we're all just like, we've just forgotten about him. Well, yeah, I, I've <laughs> totally dismissed him as he's, an NBA player altogether. He's. He's on a team with two really talented guys that just don't seem to want to play much basketball. Uh, Yeah, ma'am. Sorry, Kevin. Should have stayed in Oklahoma City. Should have stayed, man. We loved you. Uh, Someday we'll love you again, man. It's it's starting to fade a little bit. Not really, but... (laughs) <laughs> hey, if the Thunder could put a package together hey, for him. I'm back. No problem. And if you're someone, go, no, 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 there's a plan. Listen, man, when Kevin Durant's healthy, he's it's him and Giannis when it comes to being the best players in the league. And yep. it's, it's really not an argument. It's crazy. He's getting old, though, man. Yeah. Getting banged up, missing Happened games. Quick. Yeah. Happened yeah. quick. Played a lot of basketball. Plays too many minutes for them, I think. I think that they mismanaged that a little bit, maybe. On that note, episode 226 in the books. We'll have a new podcast that will drop Thursday morning. Just a reminder, you can hear Teddy from 3 to 6 on 94.7 The Ref. You can hear me from 3 to 5 on Sirius XM, Big 12 Radio, Channel 375. Hope you all have a great week. Until next time, we appreciate you all for listening. Do what you always do, Oklahoma. Take care of each other.